Yeah, so if you want to start off by introducing yourself and then talking about uh, your research, how you started it, and then how you came to be in China and be researching there. Yeah, um, so I um, I came to China in, was it 2017 or 2018? I think it was the end of 2017. Um, I um, became... Um, no, it was 2018, sorry, but I became especially interested in China in 2016. Um, I'd always had a vague interest, um, but I was working for Telesur in Quito, in Ecuador, in, in 2016, and um, I'd been working in the news for a, a good few years, uh, a few years anyway, and um, obviously China's always in the news, it's always a thing, you know, um, and that you know, has increasingly become the case. So in 2016, I just started to take more of an interest in China. I started learning Chinese um, by myself in Ecuador. I went back to Manchester, where I'm from in the UK, took some Chinese classes, and then I went to Beijing to work, work in Beijing for a few years. Um, and then it's just been a whirlwind, you know, just reading, 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 learning, you know, studying Chinese history, uh, learning more about Chinese politics, um, so I decided, you know, I want to do a PhD, um, you know, I want to do a PhD, um, I want to pursue it, you know, um, as far as I can possibly go. At the minute, I'm actually doing a second master's degree, a second postgraduate degree in China studies, contemporary China studies. Um, and next year I plan to, I intend to, um, yeah, pursue a PhD in China, in the mainland or possibly Hong Kong, we'll see. Awesome. Um, it was very cool, the, the path that you've taken to get there. So I'm curious about, I've read a little bit of your research um, with respect to like some of your writings that you've put out. Um, I read the article you wrote recently for The Diplomat on the changing nature of, of workers' conditions in China. But I'm curious about with respect to like political economy um, and researching political economy specifically in the global south, like what have been the biggest uh, aspects of your research that you've like, encountered and developed more by being in China? What have you seen there with respect to the political economy, the, the changing political economy of China? Um, well, like I said, I, well, I've lived, I've actually lived in a few places in the global south. I, I lived in Indonesia and I lived in Ecuador and now obviously China, which I still consider part of the global south, um, even though geographically it's kind of in the north, <laughs> or much of it is in the north, you could say, because it's such a huge country, you know, even, and the, you know, there are climactic differences too. Um, but I mean, I, like I said, I came here in 2017. I think there have been huge shifts in the Chinese political economy, obviously, uh, <laughs> to say, I mean, that, that's, you know, putting it lightly, right? Um, if we go back to the Mao era, of course, and then the, the reform era, um, we're talking about a revolution in itself, just just through that transition. But even during the reform era, there have been huge, huge changes in the 1980s. The, the, the economy of China in the 1980s was very different to the economy of China in the 1990s. Um, in the 1980s, the economy of China was highly decentralized um, to the point there was actually a fiscal crisis at the center um, in terms of the center's capacity to tax, to, to, to accrue taxation. Um, so in the 1990s, there was a there was a fiscal cent what's called fiscal centralization, where the center um, started to implement policies to accrue accrue um, finances from from the localities. I mean, to understand the Chinese political economy and Chinese politics more generally, you have to understand the division, the divisions, and the conflict between the the central authorities and the local authorities between centralization and decentralization and this this is a, an ongoing theme within 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 Chinese politics and at the moment of course over the past decade we've seen a reassertion of centralization um, both in in politics also within the economy too through um, the um, you know the increasing influence and power of the state-owned enterprises um, and as part, I think, of a broader project, too. So I came, like I said, I came in 2017, about, I think that's, how, yeah, halfway through the, the, the era of Xi Jinping, um, as this has been unfolding, you know. But of course, you go back to the beginning of the century, China joins the WTO, um, and that's a huge, you know, that's an enormous moment, you know. That's completely, 
um, transformed um, Chinese society, Chinese politics, the Chinese economy also. Now I think what we're seeing is a kind of response to some of the excesses that that, um, that decision to join the, the WTO caused. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have more specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but it's a big question, a general question too. Um, what I'd say is at the moment, we, 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 you know, we're experiencing a, a period of, of centralization in China, for sure. Well, I think, so I have a lot of questions and I think the first one would be to what extent, uh, as you mentioned, Xi Jinping or Xi Jinping thought is playing a role in the re-centralization or a return to something before the, the, the Deng period, I guess. Um, so that would be kind of my first question. And then kind of going off of that would be like China's changing position within uh, the world system. There's been a lot of writing recently about um, whether China is semi-peripheral or moving towards the core or, you know, it's changing status within the world system. So that's kind of a curiosity as well. And I think that relates to this conversation about China's developments and whether it's undergoing a similar process as a Western nation, whether it's doing something special. Um, and this kind of relates to like debates about whether China is, of course, the long running debate about whether China is, is capitalist, but more you know, contemporarily also, whether it's an imperialist country, which I don't think either of those things are true. And I think there's a reason within like a world system analysis that that's not true. So um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's a semi-peripheral country without a doubt. It's not, it's not part of the, the core. Um, anybody who, who goes to China and travels to, through China will tell you that, you know, there are really two Chinas. There's an urban China and a rural China. Um, and even then, on a geographical, you know, on a geographical level, you go to the northeast. It's a different, a different world to 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 the world in Beijing, where I lived. No, few people think of China deindustrializing, but during the Deng, the Deng era, the northeast deindustrialized. It was one of the industrial heartlands of the Mao era, um, and it deindustrialized in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, you go to the West, Gansu province has a per capita GDP comparable to Botswana. Um, you know, there are, there are parts of West China that are very poor. And then, of course, within these poorer regions of China, um, you also have that urban-rural division too. So there's a lot of uneven development in China. This starts really in the 19th century um, with imperialism, actually, with the British, the first Opium War. Um, and of course, though, the, the imperial powers in China at the middle of the 19th century, they opened up the treaty ports, right? Hong Kong, the east at the coastal regions. Those are also the areas that happen to be wealthiest today. Now, there are domestic policies which have contributed to that for sure, especially during the Deng era. But still, if we take a, you know, a kind of, you mentioned world systems theory. So if we think in terms of the long durée, we have to try to make this connection. And there is research on that. There is research on um, how imperial, um, like imperialism in 19th century China has contributed, has influenced and impacted its development, particularly in the 1980s after, after the reforms. Um, so yeah, so there's many Chinas actually. A moment ago, I mentioned two Chinas, a division between the rural and urban, but it's a vast country and it's still developing. It's still very much developing, you know? Um, there are huge differences in, in development status. There are huge class distinctions, of course, and there are regional, massive regional disparities as well. Um, so yeah, you mentioned, um, you asked about um, China's role in the world system. I said, and I, you know, I'd like to reaffirm it's a semi-peripheral power, but in the 1990s, it was still very much a peripheral power. Um, it's, very, it's moved into the semi-periphery really um, this century. You know, the beginning of the century, it started to move into the semi-periphery. And what is the semi-periphery? The semi-periphery is a, com a country with a combination of core processes and peripheral processes operating at the same time, right? Um, so especially, especially over the past decade or so, we've seen China move into the core in terms of specific technologies, 
5G, green tech, AI. You know, this is part of a state-led project made in China, 2015, it was called. They don't use that, um, that name much more in China because of the pushback and the aggression by the United States. But it's still there. It's a, you know, a status development, developmental model, um, import substitution, um, a lot of subsidies for core technologies and so on to try to move China up into the core in these technologies, which is succeeding um, in some fun, you know, fundamental um, areas. It is, um, but that doesn't change the fact still that China is also exploited. There's wonderful research by Min Chi Li, who's a Chinese uh, part of the Chinese New Left. He wrote a uh, very, you know, strong empirically. Um, you know, a, a strong um, book and also a piece for the monthly review, um, I think about two years ago, or maybe it was last year, with a lot of empirical data showing how China continues to be exploited by the core, by Japan and, you know, Europe and the United States. And he does it through, um, when we think of imperialism, for example, we also have to think in terms of value change, right? We have to think, um, in terms of commodities and the technology embedded within those commodities. So for decades, China's just been, it's literally, as you know, as everybody knows, it's been a cheap pool of exploitable labor um, where multinational corporations, through lax regulation in China, um, I have to say as well, have been able to exploit rural migrants and exploit the natural environment. Um, and mo basically monopolize, um, you know, um, basically, yeah, a form of monopoly capital operating in China almost, right? Um, with, with, like I said, with profits accruing in, in the global north, um, in the West and in Japan and so on. Um, that is currently, I think the current, um, the current government, uh, the, the Communist Party, I should say, is, is, is attempting um, to, to break that chain of dependency. Whether it will be able to, I mean, it appears it, it, it is currently, I think the process is unfolding as we speak, but uh, the blowback, um, not even starting with Trump prior to Trump, but intensifying under Trump um, has made clear um, how high the stakes are. Um, so it's an interesting time to be in China. You know, we're at a, a very, very dangerous historical moment. Um, but it's also interesting because you you know I think the the project we've seen in China over the past decade or so, which Samir Amin um, called you know a sovereign project essentially, um, or the attempt to develop to build to affirm a sovereign project, um, I think that's that's what's happening. That's what's happening at the moment. And I have my own criticisms. There is a class struggle in China. Um, we can't generalize and reify. There are different interests, including within the party and across the society of 1.4 billion people. Um, and it's open, it could go in multiple directions. You know, there are different interests, powerful interests, vested interests within the party state. But at the minute, um, certainly vis-a-vis -vis imperialism, um, you know, we, I think we are seeing that attempt to delink um, and technology, of course, is very much central to that. As uh, more recently over the past year, I'd say, uh, food sovereignty also, food security is becoming a big one, which of course reinvokes the idea of the land. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that was a great answer. And, but at least uh, I think, you know, another question, which is uh, obviously you mentioned the, the current crisis right now in the world. And I wonder how, the, the ramifications of this have, have been for, for for China. So, I mean, first of all, what has China's general response been? Uh, and what do you see as the approach it's taking to the crisis with Ukraine? Um, oh. And then the next would just be, as you're, as you're talking about with respect to delinking, how far along is China with getting out of dollar hegemony, getting out of the U.S. kind of financial structure, um, and is that is that potentially in some of the other conversations our group has had with, uh, like we talked to Professor Radhika Desai, who's written a lot about, you know, pluripurality and the future of the world with China as a, a you know, a pole of influence in the world economy. 
And I wonder from your perspective, how far along that is, uh, how much is, how much more there is to go um, and kind of what the shifts within, as you've been describing the shifts in, in political economy towards a, a de-linked China, like the ramifications that will also have for the world, for the United States and for this opportunity for a, a pluripolar world where the global South can kind of act in a more independent manner. Yeah, good, very, very good challenging questions. I have to say, um, you know, I think my, my political orientation developed uh, through Iraq and Afghanistan through reading, you know, great anti-colonial thinkers. Um, you know, that, that, that's always been the basis of my politics and it's part of why I became interested in China. But since coming here and I'd say for the past six years or so, I've very much really been focusing on China's domestic situation because what I found with my own politics is this tendency to reify and to, to think of geopolitical entities as concrete and fixed. And with China, I didn't, well, it, well, it was part of my political development as well. I was also interested in what's happening within countries too, you know. So within China, a lot of my reading, a lot of the things I research and stuff actually focuses on its domestic situation because I think I don't think you can disconnect its international um, situation from the domestic one. And I sometimes think this is a mistake um, people on the left can make. Sometimes they focus too much, too much on domestic class struggle um, at the expense of imperial power and world systems theory. Uh, and then sometimes others go to the the opposite end, you know, the other extreme where they they focus very much on, on a kind of world systems analysis um, without really taking into account what's happening domestically. So um, over the past five, six years, I've really been trying to um, understand what's happening domestically in China. With the intention though, at PhD level of, of, of focusing on this, this, this question of imperialism and China's relationship to the world system, where it fits in with that and how the class struggle within China, um, both, within society and through the state, because I think the state, of course, has a class character, um, which is representative of class forces within society, um, how that domestic situation, how the Chinese state as a, an extension of various social and class struggles happening domestically um, will operate at the level of the international. I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but I just wanted to make that point that um, I'm not sure whether I'm in the best um, position right now um, to, to, you know, to give you a, a very comprehensive, detailed, on-point answer when it comes to China's relationship in relation to the global South and imperialism. Uh, maybe maybe next in a year or two, we should chat again. Um, but what I will say is, um, like I said, um, um, there's a lot happening in China too, you know, a lot happening in China too. There are all kinds of struggles taking place. Um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, China was described as the center of labor unrest, um, just a decade ago. Um, you know, there are, there are movements and struggles for um, land justice in China. Um, there is big capital in China, you know, there is big capital. To, that's being repressed to an extent right now, um, at least in the tech sector. Um, but there is a class struggle, class struggle in China. There's a capital labor relation in China, which needs to be needs to be considered. Um, and like I said, there are, there are, you know there are struggles for land too. Um, so at the moment, I think China China is in a a, a strange position domestically. Um, well, there are a number of crises in China, and I think part of the, the, this process of centralization we've seen is an attempt by um, a faction of the Communist Party. Um, I think it's an attempt to overcome them, to batten down the ashes, so to speak. I think they're very perceptive of what's happening globally. A lot of uh, China changed after the 2008 financial crisis, I think. Um, China changed a great deal. If you listen to the, the speeches of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiaobao in 2003, 4, and 5, they're very different to the speeches that were made after Xi Jinping came to power. And even towards the end of Hu Jintao's era in 2012, um, he gave a speech that was very different in tone. It was darker in tone. 
compared to the kinds of speech he was giving when he came to power at the beginning of the century. So I think 2008 changed a lot. I think the, um, you know, the, 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 the reality of capitalist crisis, um, became, you know, was discussed in China a great deal um, within the party. But I mean, within, within the, um, the institutions, the organizations, the academic institutions, I should say, um, connected to the Communist Party and connected to the government. So there's a huge shift after 2008. And then, of course, we can't disconnect the international situation. Um, there's the, the Arab Spring, the protests in Egypt, the, the civil war, or some people don't like to call it a civil war, but nonetheless, the war in Syria or the war on Syria, whatever your politics are. Um, the NATO um, bombardment of Libya, all of these things, I think, feed into a sense of crisis. Um, within the party, or at least within a faction of the party. I, I have to emphasize this idea of a faction within the party, um, because there are different factions and different interests. It's a huge organization of 80, 90 million people. How could there not be? We can't see it as monolithic. Um, and then, of course, um, Xi Jinping comes to power. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a financial crisis. Not many people not, are aware of this, but there is a financial crisis in China in 2015. It's brought under control quite quickly. But, um, on, you know, it's, it's a financial crisis on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, um, which also um, reaffirms this idea of centralization, reaffirms this idea that capital is getting out of control. Um, so you see all kinds of controls placed on capital flows in, in and out of China, for example. It's hard to send money home. Uh, not hard, even for me, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a ball ache, I, should, I could say, to, you know, send money back to the UK if I want to do that. So there are, there are controls on capital leaving the country because, of course, there's a lot of wealth being leaving China too um, during the reform era, um, which is also considered a risk. Um, so after 2015, we again, we see this, this uh, intensification of this process of centralization. And then 2017, you know what happened then, right? 2016, Trump is elected. The trade war is launched in 2017. And um, so we have the, you know, we have these mountain risks, this mountain sense of insecurity, um, this assertion of the need for security. So we see new ideas emerging, not so much new ideas, but um, you could say evolutions of ideas of security in China. Securitization becomes a big theme. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a, a, a set of policies called the comprehensive national security concept, um, which again, is being influenced and impacted by the global situation. Um, and then also, you know, 2017, like I said, the US-China trade war um, intensifies and evolves into a broader technological war and clearly, clearly now an attempt at containment. Um, and on top of that, um, well, sorry, last year, then you have um, this idea of common prosperity emerge. Um, and that's when you start seeing crackdowns and stuff on um, the tech sector in China, on, on um, the financial sector, which has been hit since 2015, since that mini crisis in 2015. So we see all of these new, new policies emerge just last year. Um, so we have to understand this situation. And we also have to understand that the, this is not just happening in, in, internationally. There are also problems in China too. Um, like I said, inequality, inequality of income, inequality of wealth, um, the rural-urban divide, um, various struggles, like I said, as particularly labor struggles and land land struggles in China. All of this also is feeding into a sense of crisis. And now, of course, you have a, a demographic crisis too. Um, one of the big positives, um, if you're looking at the Mao era, even from the perspective of a, of a capitalist, one of the big positives that came out of it in 1980 was all of a sudden you had a very, very young labor force. Why did you have a young labor force? Because in 19, after 1949, um, life expectancy almost doubles in China. Um, infant mortality is dramatically reduced. So at the beginning of the reforms, you have a very young population, you know, in the prime, in their physical prime, who were able to work. That's finished. Um, that's finished. Um, you know, China has an older population now. Um, it does have a demographic crisis, and this also feeds into, um, you know, the, this sense of crisis. And then, of course, sorry, I didn't even mention the pandemic. 
the pandemic, of course, um, and how that's feeding into this broader crisis of, of capitalism. Um, and who knows what's coming next? Now we have Ukraine. You mentioned Ukraine, sorry. Um, that's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. I mean, um, there's a tendency, I think, at the moment to lump Russia and China together. Um, American officials are doing this. The liberal intelligentsia, intelligen intelligentsia loves to do this. The media love to do this. And of course, even, even some parts of the left love to do this. I think it's a bit more complicated than that. I think, um, obviously, China and Russia share historical grievances. They share a huge border. Um, they have different political systems. You know, anybody who wants to define both as authoritarian, if you want to do that, that's fine, but it doesn't explain anything. That doesn't tell you anything about the Chinese political system. I, I don't know much about, honestly, I don't know too much about the Russian political system, but it is a very reductive concept and term. Um, so they have two very different systems, and I think they have different interests. You know, in, in many ways, I think the US has pushed them closer together, um, but I do think they have divergent interests. Um, and I don't think it's in China's interests. Um, I don't think this, this intervention or invasion, this war in Ukraine is in China's interests at all. I mean, just on a material level, it's not, uh, you know, in terms of food, food security, it's not, um, you know, a grain prices and obviously the, the impact it's going to have on global economic stability. Um, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I think um, if you here though, in China, I think there is a, um, a clear pro, pro Russia um, sentiment on social media and also in state media too. Um, but I, I wonder though, I, I question whether that's more about being pro Russia or more about um, framing it through NATO and through the US. I think it's likely um, the latter, the latter of the two. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it definitely does. And, and it seems like uh, more likely as well, like um, the reaction of being against the US and, and having that similar position with respect to the situation in Russia. But I wonder also to, to ask you about, um, you mentioned the, you know, the, the stock market and, uh, and the stock market crisis in China. And, and we're seeing, you know, more recently, and you talked about this um, as well on your Twitter a little bit of uh, recent fluctuations within the, the Chinese stock market, recent changes within uh, Xi Jinping's uh, policy towards markets and towards, uh, you know, the stock market as a whole. So I wonder if you can explain that a little bit, because I, I don't follow China as closely. And I was sort of confused to see this, the, the Western press kind of talking about this and seemingly in a very wrong manner. Um, so I wonder what actually happened and what, what the change in policy was. Yeah. I'm not an economist, so let's just let's just let me just say that. Yeah, but maybe that's a good thing, though, because a lot of economists are reductive as well in their own analysis, you know. Um, but I'm not an economist in any by any stretch of the imagination. I am um, um, preoccupied with political economy now, um, after going through some years of being lost in a kind of identitarian universe, you could say. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I think that you know the 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 power of a political economy approach is that it takes materialism into account, right? Um, and and that, that I think is really important just as a mode of a tool of analysis, you know? Um, but I mean, it's interesting. And again, I think there are divisions within the party and I think we've seen them over the past, the past week or two. Um, the two sessions just passed in China uh, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe I'm not sure if your listeners or yourself know what the two sessions is, but it's an annual um, kind of party slash government conference um, event, a, a big event um, where, you know, different delegates and officials come together from across the country, including local officials, central officials, to discuss, debate and hash out new policies for the new year and also to reflect on the past year. And um, historically, at the two sessions, a growth target has been established and set for the coming year, right? Um, I think for the past couple of years, that's not happened, um, probably because of the, 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 the coronavirus uh, and the crisis um, that caused. But also, I thought, and I still think to an extent, I certainly I know there's a faction um, within the party who, who believes this because it's, it's 
it's it's it's literally it's discussed quite a lot in China the idea the need for more balanced growth, which means lower growth, um, because growth high growth in China means as as meant over the past few decades, especially since two thousand and eight, um, stimulus, um, which in practice has resulted in infrastructure building, you know the development of infrastructure. Highly carbon intensive, of course. Um, so under under Hu Jintao and Wen Jiaobao, there was a lot of talk of balanced development, rebalancing growth away from this addiction to high growth and pro infrastructure, you know, kind of development model. Um, and under Xi Jinping too, um, that has been maintained. Um, but um, at the two sessions, um, just just got, which has just passed, um, a relative well. A, a relatively high growth rate was set at 5.5%, um, you know, 5.5% growth for the coming year, which obviously, of course, compared to 10 years ago is, is modest um, by Chinese standards, but um, it, it was the high, it was, it's at the high end of, of what people were predicting. Um, and we, we're going to see, I think, more stimulus now in the economy, which means we're going to see, um, you know, we're very likely going to see um, the development of infrastructure. Um, and it does seem to contradict a lot of the messaging. Even last year with Common Prosperity, a lot of the messaging that's come out of Beijing. Um, so I don't, have, I don't have a clear answer as to why this is the case. Of course, the international situation is feeding into it, though. The situation in, the, in, in Ukraine hasn't helped. Um, the pandemic isn't helping. I just came out of lockdown. I was in lockdown for two weeks in my home in China. Uh, people in the UK, they're, they're almost living in an alternate reality, you know. Um, and this is obviously going to drag, uh, you know, drag on the economy. Um, and then I, I do think there is some foresight as well. I do think we're obviously in a longer crisis. And I think um, at least the, the party elite, the, the Politburo, the, the, the powerful people in the party, and, and many of the think tanks too, you know, many thinkers in China are aware of this. Um, so I don't, I don't have a clear answer to your question, but I was kind of surprised by that high growth rate. Um, and that does suggest that um, some of the messaging and policies that were unleashed, you could say, last year, um, that gave a lot of people hope for an intensification in the attempt to rebalance China's economy, to put it on a more sustainable footing, um, to you know, um, deal concretely with some of these distortions that have emerged over the past four decades, um, and many of the inequalities that have, have come out of that. Um, we didn't hear much about common prosperity at the two sessions, and we haven't really much over the past couple of months, which is surprising. Well, again, I guess you could argue um, that there's always going to be adjustments and readjustments in China dependent on strategy, dependent on what's happening in the world and the, the state of equilibrium within, within China itself. So I assume it's a strategic um, move, um, you know, um, and I'm sure it will change again at some point. But the question I have then is if, 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 if we're in a crisis, if we're in a longer crisis, and if this is the response whenever um, the crisis becomes more visible, more present, more threatening, um, then how will it be possible um, to truly, truly um, reinvent the Chinese economy, which is, which is what a lot of people think is necessary, including people within China? That's a great perspective on that, and I, I, I wondered about that too, and, and what exactly that looks like. Um, and the two kind of questions that I have remaining, I guess the first one to take a domestic look, and then the next to take more of a foreign look with respect to that question. But the first is on the subject of how, as you're saying, how much prosperity still factors into the goals of, of the party. And I know that there were, there's been a lot recently about uh, China's crusade against poverty and absolute poverty. And I wonder mm -hmm. from being there with, within China and studying it, um, I wonder the effects you've seen of this campaign against poverty, um, you know, what the progress has been and, and how 
it potentially uh, attests to something different being done uh, within China in terms of a different style of development. So I'm, I'm more curious about that personally in, in how far the government has gone to abolish uh, extreme poverty. Well, it's gone very far, hasn't it, in abolishing extreme poverty? I mean, the, 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 the figures are staggering. And even, even critics of China find it difficult to argue, argue against that, right? Um, I, have, I have heard, I have read um, criticisms of, of the, the fact that hundreds of millions of people are no longer in poverty today in China uh, compared to, um, you know, the 1980s. But, um, I mean, there are criticisms out there, but they tend to deal more with nuances. I mean, generally speaking, it's broadly considered, um, you know, to be a, a huge, huge, huge success story. Um, I mean, I don't think I'm the person to to ask this question. If you want, you know, nuances and details and stuff, I I have recently become very preoccupied with the land question in China. Um, but I mean, very recently, and it was actually Samir Amin who got me interested in this question because I have been reading a lot of his work, and um, you know, obviously, the China's revolution was a land based revolution. It was in a, a rural, like a a peasant-led revolution. Um, and there are so many contradictions within the land in China, within how the land is managed, within land politics and so on, that it's very hard to even make sense of it. So maybe maybe we can chat again at some point in the future when I've explored um, this huge, huge, huge area more. But what I will say is um, I'm mostly based in urban coastal regions at the moment. Um, you know, I've done some traveling in China, but then the, the coronavirus actually has kind of limited that over the past couple of years, to be honest. Um, you know, I've been to the Northeast though, which was, like I said, that was one of the, um, the center of the proletariat, you could say, during the Mao era. Um, today it's struggling economically, it's deindustrialized in, in many ways. Um, and, you know, um, I think a lot needs to be done there. A lot needs to be done there. Um, you know, you might compare it to some of the, you know, in, in the US, uh, you, you know, what do you call it? The Rust Belt. Some people call it the Chinese Rust Belt. Um, so that, that there, are, there are social problems there and so on, which you may not find in many other parts of China due to that, due to those legacies of reform. I'm not sure what the particular policies are. I'm sure there are policies to attempt to solve this, this, um, social crisis in the northeast um, but you are, we also have to that's my point we also have to recognize how big china is and how it's governed differently across space like different regions almost have i don't want to say they have different political systems because that would be a stretch um but there are huge distinctions and differences um, across regions in china and there are different political economies you know, Inner Mongolia, for example, is a coal-based um, economy, um, you know, um, which means, you know, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs just tied in with the coal sector, heavy industry. Um, now, you go to where I am in Suzhou, which is close to Shanghai, and it's a, it's a service sector economy. Um, and Shanghai and Beijing are massively service sector, you know, they, they are the, the, the definition of service sector economies. And then, of course, there, there are agrarian economies, too. There are agricultural economies. China still has, despite all of its urbanization, still has a, has a huge, huge, huge agricultural sector. Um, and, of course, there are different types of poverty built into these different political economies. Um, so Beijing, for example, is in terms of per capita GDP, is one of uh, China's wealthier, wealthier areas. But there's still some forms of poverty there. I was actually living in a hutong, which is like a traditional Beijing neighborhood, a quite unique place to live. Um, I mean, you only find them in Beijing. And, um, you know, my next door neighbor, you know, I would describe as in relative poverty, you know, relative poverty uh, in terms of the, you know, the living, the living, um, the living life quality and so on. Um, and then, of course, a lot of the urban poverty in Beijing will be experienced by rural migrants who um, work in the city, but they lack a rural, uh, sorry, an urban hukou, which is like the, the passport system in China. Um, therefore, they're denied um, certain key rights uh, in social welfare and so on. 
So the urban rural divide is huge, but there have been big reforms in the Huko system too over the past decade or so. But it depends where you are. Again, in Beijing, they're very strict. In Shanghai, they're very strict. Um, but maybe in some smaller Chinese cities, they're more open to rural migrants moving there and establishing, establishing a life there. So I'm sorry, I know that doesn't answer your question at all. I think it's, it's a difficult one to answer just because of the size and the, the scale and um, the differences within China and how it's governed and managed and, and so on. And the, yeah, the, the uneven development, I'd say. Um, it's not just, it's not a, you know, it's not a, a wealthy urban economy. That's not China. You can't think of it in any, you know, in, in, uni in a unitary way. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's obviously moved into the semi-periphery like we, we discussed already, but um, it also has legacies of uneven development which have been produced by that longer history of imperialism and not just imperialism, but what imperialism did, um, how it distorted Chinese development. And even also, you could say, um, well, certainly say some of the policies uh, um, introduced during the Mao era and afterwards too. Um, lastly, I would say the, the anti-poverty campaign, um, was it last year or 2020, right? They, the Chinese government announced that it had abolished effectively extreme poverty. Um, this is not an area I've looked at in, in tremendous detail. I do have a couple of friends who have worked on the anti-poverty campaign out in the West. Um, in fact, um, one, one woman I know here in Suzhou um, worked on, I think she spent a year working on an anti-poverty campaign in a rural area in Suzhou, which was um, essentially a program to transfer people from the West to cities in the East. Um, they had some kind of exchange um, where they can, you know, access urban environments, be provided with a job and so on. It's very, it's very multifaceted. There's all kinds of programs. You know, when you think of the anti-poverty campaign, people tend to think of it in monolithic terms, you know, but there's all kinds of initiatives and solutions and programs happening at a very local level too. Um, and it's clearly, it's clearly, look, it's clearly um, succeeded in its, in its um, overall um, goals, I think. But there are lots of contradictions built into it. One of them being sustainability. So one of the things I've read is um, how, yes, people have been lifted out of, or people have um, moved out of extreme poverty, but is there a sustainable, Kind of architecture in place to make sure they never fall back into poverty again. Um, another is, um, in many ways, it was you know applied in a very top-down fashion. So um, you know you you have people in rural communities, for example, who may not want to engage with or participate in or be shifted, moved effectively from from the place they grew up, from their community, and so on. But in some cases, they were they were you know essentially forced into urban communities, like nice apartments from what I hear in, in many cases that had been built specifically as part of this campaign. But of course that, that um, might conflict with somebody, you know, a group's particular interests. But so there's a lot, it's, it's a big question again, um, with a lot of confusing information, you know, contradictions, I think, uh, conflicting um, narratives and so on, um, yeah. And, and kind of on a similar note, I'm curious about what you wrote about recently uh, about the worker struggle, um, the emerging, uh, you, you know, you talked about the 996 campaign, for example, which is against a, a certain style of living um, and a certain overworking um, that's become, become prevalent. And so I wonder your perspective too on that. This is really, the fascinating aspect of, I think, a lot of these things is this idea of human development and, and, and change. But I wonder how this backlash against overworking, we also saw recently, uh, you know, a crackdown on, on billionaires that played some, some role in, in this, in this popular sentiment that uh, billionaire class has grown very quickly. And there has been, I think, you know, from my point of view, um, 
observing it, obviously, a lot of frustration with that. But I wonder what you've experienced with respect to the worker struggle and the, the culture of work um, and how it's changing within China. Mm. There are grievances. Um, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, um, but you could say the party state almost split in, no, no, it's an exaggeration, but there, were, there, was, there was an emerging division within the Communist Party um, around the period of the financial crisis. Um, two models emerged in China, or they were, they were, they were classified, they were, they were called, referred to as two models, the Guangdong model and the, the, the Chongqing model. A Chongqing model um, being led by Bo Xilai, who was, of course, um, taken out in the anti-corruption campaign, um, the biggest figure, um, or at least the most high-profile figure um, to be taken out in that campaign. Um, and these two models spoke to two very different social groups that had emerged in Chinese society through the reforms. Um, Guangdong, of course, is, is on the coast. Um, I think it is the wealthiest um, region of China. Um, it's either, it must be, yeah, it must be. And of course, it's, it's the home of the reforms. It's where the reforms first started, right? In Shenzhen, around that area. Um, so the, the quality of life in Guangdong, if you're, if, you know, in some of these big cities in Guangdong, if you're born there is, is higher, if you have an urban eco, especially, is higher than it would be in some of the inland regions, of course, much higher. Um, so there is research on this about the class character of the Guangdong model. Um, I'll send you, I'll send you a paper that I think a lot of people should read, um, because it, it it really does it really does um, bring into sharp focus the cleavages as well um, within within the party and within the people within the, within the people as well within within the Chinese population um, that have that have occurred and intensified. Um, due to decades of reform and opening. So Chongqing, of course, is in the West, far away from the coast, very much inland, an inland province. And um, up until, I'm still poorer, but uh, up until um, more recently, very recently, um, was, you know, significantly poorer, a different, a different political economy um, with different industries and so on. Um, so whereas Guangdong is, you could say, is a lot more integrated into global finance capital, or has been historically, whereas it's you know been a lot more in, integrated in um, global commodity and value chains. Um, a lot of the multinationals, of course, Foxconn being a big one um, and a highly controversial one, but also a lot of the textile brands and stuff we we wear in not in China also actually, but across the world. I've set up shop there in the 1980s, right, in the 1990s, especially the 1990s. Um, so, so Guangdong has a, a, has a different, a different, um, a different experience, you could say, of the reforms compared to, you know, a poorer part of the country in the West, England, um, like like Chongqing and its surrounding regions. Um, and this, this. Um, so when Bo Xilai came to power, he, he also spoke of common prosperity. Um, so common prosperity, actually, is a Mao era term, right? Um, and it's always existed within China on some level, but it became a big thing around this period. The cake debate, it was called. The cake debate being um, the, the Guangdong, I forget the name of the provincial secretary, the party secretary of Guangdong. Um, but at the time, he said, the cake, we just need to grow the cake. We don't need to worry about dividing it. Yeah, Bo Xilai said, no, we need to, the, the cake has grown too big. Now we need to cut the cake and divide it more evenly. Um, but I want to get away from the two figures, these two individuals. I think sometimes we focus too much on these, these two particular leaders, especially Bo Xilai and especially even Xi Jinping now. Um, I think what was essentially happening there is they were speaking to two groups the two, two divergent groups that had experienced reform and opening in two very, very, very different ways. Um, Bo Xilai was articulating um, a set of grievances um, around labor, around the HUCO system um, that, yeah, that, that um, spoke to some of the losers of the reform process. Um, whereas the, the Guangdong model was more 
a, a, a reaffirmation uh, of, of reform and opening um, and, and more liberal in many ways, economically speaking. Um, I've actually forgot what your initial question was. Oh, sorry, it was on it was on the billionaires and these recent developments right around workers and stuff. So common prosperity and becomes um, part of the language of the Chongqing model. And like I said, the Chongqing model, it's not about just one particular leader. Um, it's about um, these broader, broader grievances uh, and this broader anger that had been building in China for decades. Um, and continues to exist, continues to exist. Like I said, there were huge labor strikes in China just a decade ago. Um, there are still labor strikes in China. The delivery drivers I wrote about, um, you know, there's been a, an uptick in activism led by delivery drivers in recent years because they're a very visible part of the, the they're just a very visible presence in, in Chinese society. Um, and of course, they're, they've all, they're also economically exploited by big tech capital too. Um, so again, we have to, um, I think when we, particularly now, right now with what's happening in China, we have to read and try to understand the pol politics again through this idea of security and insecurity. And ultimately, um, it's a risk, you know, it's a risk to have angry workers um it just is right it is and um but there's also a relationship between angry workers and the state um because i i do genuinely believe there is a faction um or there you know there are parts of the communist party um that are you know very much pro-worker um you know they the, the the legacy of maoism the legacy of revolutionary transformation and revolutionary politics in china may not always be clearly visible, but it's still there. Um, and there is a nostalgia too. There is a nostalgia which emerged, especially like 10, 15 years ago um, for the Mao era. Um, but even today, even today, there's, some of that still exists. So I see what's happening now as a rearticulation of some of those grievances. Um, whether it goes far enough, I, I don't know. Um, I find it had I, I don't see how that's possible unless um, the Chinese working class and peasantry are also empowered. Um, and I think this will emerge as a huge contradiction in common prosperity. And um, at the moment, you have a faction within the party who I think believe and would, you know, who, who believe common prosperity is, um, you know, the correct direction to take. Um, but as you just said, you also have um, a lot of wealth in China, not just separate from the party, within the party too. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen the, the, the visible emergence of this cleavage um, with Chongqing and Guangdong, but also now, you know, over the past decade. Um, how it develops, we can't really say, can we? Um, but, um, you know, it... That I think that will emerge as a as a huge a huge issue a huge problem. Um, I was very I was very upbeat about the common prosperity thing when it you know when it was first announced. There's a lot of my friends were in China, you know, a lot of my Chinese friends also. Um, but the question is, um, is this going to just be something um, legislated or pushed through in a top down manner, um, or will we see? Because China is huge, 1.4 billion people across a continental, you know, a, a vast, basically, you know, a, a country of that, that's effectively a continent in many ways. I mean, it's huge. Um, so how do you how do you ensure that it penetrates across space, across regions, across localities, and across class lines? Um, empowerment. It has to be empowerment, right? And then the you know what that there may be. I think there are ways to do that within China. I think the system as it currently exists, there are ways to do it. Like, for example, um, we have like, this will be very alien to any American and any European, but there is a there's a neighborhood committee system in China. Every neighborhood has a, has a, has a committee that you, you can go to with your problems, or they, they also oversee stuff. They effectively govern as well, um, but it's at a really hyper local level so that the party state penetrates very deeply at the grassroots that's what i'm saying um so if maybe that i don't know maybe that could be a tool 
um, you know, to, to, to implement stuff at the grassroots. But I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. But certainly empowerment and class struggle can't be dismissed. We can't just um, view common prosperity as a, as a top-down initiative um, if it's to really, really, really essentially revolutionize, restructure the economy, right? Restructure the political economy and um, rebalance it in a, in a more equitable and just direction. Uh, I think it needs to be twofold. Grassroots um, with a combination of, you know, state, state-led developmentalism and initiative. Well, I think that that definitely prompts my last question. Um, and just kind of in, in concluding, wondering what the future of this development model is. And it, it's so hard to make predictions. Obviously, I'm not asking you to become a fortune seller or anything, but I wonder what you perceive as the, the future of work culture in China. And that, I mean, that really is the heart of a lot of, of, of these questions is what is the, the method of work and labor itself. Um, and then on a more perhaps macro scale, uh, like you said, not, not focusing too much on the foreign aspects of it, but just wondering perhaps in the short term what this new crisis makes um, for China and like the ramifications it could have in the future. But in addition to that, just in the long run of things, what the uh, rise of China, if you want to put it that way, or the continued development of it as a power that can match the United States will have as an effect for the working class within China, um, for prosperity as a whole, for these uh, initiatives of development and human development in particular. So kind of wondering, I guess, like in a, in a concluding remark, I know it's so hard to make a prediction, but uh, to see what the current status uh, has to bear for this, this future development, I guess, of this uh, project? It's extremely difficult for any country from the global south, from the periphery, to move into the core, right? That's why it's the core, right? <laughs> because it, it polices, right? It polices um, through imperial power, um, through financial power, economic power, and... Um, you know, in, increasingly through through military power, not increasingly as such, but I, it would appear the US is moving in that direction right now. Uh, it's extremely difficult, um, even for China. It, you know, studying China has made me realize how difficult it is. Um, I don't buy into the, the rise of China thing. I mean, China has risen, of course, but I don't think its future is predetermined. Um, I think it's in a, a very difficult position right now. Um, I think the uneven nature of Chinese development is becoming increasingly clear to me. Um, and the reaction from the US with its financial power, as we're seeing in Russia, which is actually, which is, is unprecedented. Um, I don't think we've ever seen anything like it. You know, I don't. I don't think we've ever seen anything like it. Um, you know, dollarization, the role of the, the hegemony of the dollar in the world system. How does China navigate that? I mean, first of all, even though, even though I focused on the domestic situation in China at the moment, uh, I don't disconnect the two ever. Um, in fact, everything, everything, every time I read something on Chinese politics, Chinese society, I'm always trying to connect it to what's happening internationally. And I think it's actually a tragedy that people try to disconnect them. How can you possibly disconnect a domestic situation from the global situation? So my reading, yeah, my understanding of changes in China over the past decade are very much tied in with that international situation. And I think, I think the next 10 years, the next 10 years are going to be really, really, really decisive. Um, the middle income trap, of course, which we hear about a lot, um, is, is a possibility for China, right? It is a, it's, a, it's a stark possibility with the, demo, the, the state of the demographic crisis and the pushback from the US. But the pushback, especially in technology, right? Um, because you also have to, we have to, again, I keep going back to the population thing and the size of China, but really, the, you know, the, the Communist Party is governing a country of 1.4 billion people, um, again, with uneven, uneven development um, across, across, across the country. 
And it's doing so in an, in an international environment that's increasingly hostile to its sovereign project. And I do consider it a sovereign project. Um, so, I mean, it's a big question. I certainly can't predict the future, as you said, but um, I do, I think it's, you know, I think, yeah, the next 10 years will reveal a lot, the coming years, the next few years even. Um, how far is the party willing to go? Um, to really, you know, introduce a broad set of, you know, a broad framework of redistribution. Um, I don't know. It's a tough one. Um, yeah. What, what, what was your other question? Sorry. Yeah, just what the effects of the international, like, conflicts between the U.S. and China um, economically and politically will have on the situation um, domestically with respect to the development of the working class? Mm. Um, I mean, the Chinese working class is a, is a, is a funny kind of thing. Um, there, I, I, prefer, I mean, there's not, of course, there's not one working class, right? There are many different laboring classes. And I think because of the, 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 the size and the role of the peasantry too, uh, within China and uh, rural migrants as well. Um, I mean, the challenges the Chinese economy faces are, are really, um, I mean, uh, where do you begin? Where do you begin? Um, they're huge, let's put it that way. Um, and they're structural. Um, and it requires a level of ambition um, and centralization that we may be seeing, that we may be seeing but still, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's enough. I'm not sure if um, the way common prosperity has been framed um, is enough to tackle the issues China faces. I mean, just in 2020, Li Keqiang, the um, Chinese um, prime minister, who's, who's, who's about to, he'll be leaving this year, he'll be leaving his post this year. He said that, um, China still has 600 million people living on less than $100 a day. Okay, 600 million people living on less. Sorry, sorry, $100, sorry, $100 a month, I think it was. Not, certainly not a day. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's, you know that's, 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 that's peripheral. That's, that's the peripheral processes within China, right? In a very concrete, concrete form. Um, and how do you overcome that? I mean, in, in, I don't want to be too gloomy because I, I think, uh, especially over the past decade or so, we, I think the reassertion of the state um, in development, I mean, the state's always been there in China in development, but it's asserted itself in some key ways in the financial sector um, and in, like I said, in industrialization. So there's a very concerted, centralized effort and attempt at the moment to mobilize resources, to mobilize technology, to mobilize investment, to mobilize human power, labor power, um, in the direction of answering the question you've just asked. Um, so there is a level of consciousness and there's a level of planning that we just don't have, but we don't have planning. You don't have planning where you are now. Um, your government doesn't plan. My government doesn't plan, right? We know that. There's a level of planning in China that I think is a positive. Um, and I think there's a level of ambition too. Um, and thinking dialectically, again, much of it forced through, 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 through class struggle. Um, and I do think the Chinese state is responsive. I don't think it's completely autonomous and detached from social relations. There is a class character to every state. Um, but I mean, I like the idea. There is a there is a some research um, published quite re recently, um, but it's an ongoing theme um, within the Chinese state of it being a combination of repressiveness with responsiveness. So it does respond to societal demands too. Um, so I mean, it has the. I think the tools are there. I think the system is there on some level. Um, I think the legacies are there too. I think the, the, the mobilizational capacity of the Chinese state is really impressive. And we saw that um, very clearly in Wuhan, 
um, and since, since the coronavirus emerged, where the state was able to mobilize um, and unleash, essentially, um, its, its resources, its power, its tools towards a specific goal. Um, and I've actually written about this for the monthly review. Um, so I'm not sure if you've read that, but um, the, there is a, a mobilizational capacity to the Chinese state, which is unusual and again, penetrates the grassroots. So the capacity of the Chinese state to mobilize, um, you know, people at the, very, at, the, at the community level is very impressive. So, um, so we'll see, I guess, we'll see. Um, what I do know is um, American imperialism um, is, is clearly intent on a policy of containment. Um, and that is a concern, obviously, a concern not just for not just for China, the Chinese government and people within China. I think it's a concern for anybody um, interested in in you know basically just justice in the global south, right? Justice within countries that are trying to delink to break the chains of the American financial project, um, which was obviously born after the Second World War and has really intensified over the past few decades. Um, but it's, it's going to be a struggle, um, obviously. I mean, the, 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 I, I say a struggle also because the, 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 the goals of the party are very ambitious. If you listen to what their plans are for 2030, 2035 and 2049, which will be the centenary of the foundation of the People's Republic of China. They're extremely ambitious. Um, and it's unclear whether, whether that ambition um, will, will become a reality. We really don't know, do we? But I, what I do know is, is, is West, not just the West, Japan also, and a couple of other countries are uh, very much intent on guaranteeing those ambitions are not met. Definitely. Um, and you mentioned the monthly review article. I actually had meant to ask you about it. Um, so I may just ask one very short final, final question um, on that, which I actually did get a chance to read it. And I was, uh, I was fascinated with this idea you were discussing of, of the concept of, so, you know, one scholar talking about revolutionary authoritarianism and revolutionary exceptionalism. So I wonder if you can talk so very briefly, and, and you've been mentioning it a little bit throughout of disputes within the party or disputes within the, the bureaucracy uh, as a whole, but just how COVID kind of emphasized this and the, I guess just yeah, the subject of, of the article in general, if you, I know it's hard to summarize, but I also found it fascinating to understand the ways the bureaucracy has changed, how the state structure and the party structure has changed with response to COVID as this kind of life or death struggle with these wartime measures, as you said, um, and how that may impact the, the party and the state going forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, I think there's two ways to look at um, the, the way China responded to, to COVID. One is to see it as a, a source of strength in that, again, just going back to what I said about the mobilizational capacity and power of the state, Another is to see it as a sign of weakness in that it lacked the um, institutional institutionalism to deal with it in a, in a softer way, you could say, if that makes sense. So um, by framing it as a life and death struggle, it literally was treated as one. I mean, you know, I've lived, <laughs> I've lived for a few lockdowns in China now, and um, it's, it's, you know, it's taken very, very, very seriously. And I'm a big fan of that. I, I've been, I've supported zero, China's zero COVID measures. But again, because I think they're necessary because of the state of Chinese development, um, particularly in rural areas, um, which were effectively gutted in the 1990s uh, by under Jiang Zemin, essentially. And we've seen, we've, we have seen, um, you know, a rebalancing of growth, more funding for rural areas, agricultural tax was abolished, at the, a number of agricultural taxes were abolished at the beginning of this century. There's also, you know, been more resources directed towards spending on social welfare in rural areas, but the scale of the problem is so vast that in one way, 
um, the, the assertion of the state and the mobilization of the state during COVID can be seen. And I think it's correct to see it as um, partly a response to some of those weaknesses um, and inequalities within China as well. But the reason I wrote that article is because, um, well, I wrote it for a few, a few reasons. One is um, I'm interested in this idea of mobilization, which of course comes from the revolution. It comes from the war against Japan. It comes from class struggle um, during the Mao era. It was a huge, huge, huge um, mode of governance during Maoism, during the Mao era. There were all kinds of campaigns you know, that were, that were rolled out as a form of nation building effectively. And I'm sure you can name a few, like there were campaign after campaign after campaign, right? <laughs> During the Mao era, that's how that, that was one of the, your main, the main styles of governance. And it hasn't gone away. Um, you know, it didn't even, it, during the 1980s and 90s and 2000s, it's not gone, and, gone anywhere. And I do find it interesting because when, sometimes when people think of the reforms, they think of a complete disconnection from the Maoist past, right? Um, and I can see why a lot of people would think that. Um, it's not unreasonable to think that, you know what I mean? Um, but there are also lots of lineages too, and continuities. And the way the state mobilizes, how it frames um, social issues and crises um, is often done through Maoist rhetoric and also through, through a Maoist style of campaign governance as well. Um, so I think, I, you know, on the left as well, we need to, or we, you know, if we're interested in China, we should try to make sense of these continuities. And there are, there are loads of discontinuities too, don't get me wrong. Um, but still, I, I do think it's important um, to recognize those continuities as well. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to inform me more about your research and what you've experienced personally getting to live in China. Um, I'm definitely going to continue uh, the discussion with you by, by Twitter. I'll definitely continue being in touch because I'm really curious to kind of follow uh, everything that you uh, get to experience and see living in China. And just generally, I think, like you said, it's one of the most important uh, countries and, and economies and, and systems to follow in our lifetime right now. So thank you so much. And I know we can't get to every topic and some are, are so large that they're difficult to really even broach, but hopefully, you know, this definitely sparked a lot more um, interest in me and things I need to go and research and learn more about. So yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, um, thank you also. It's always good to chat to a, you know, a fellow, fellow soul, you could say, you know, concerned about what's going on uh, in China, in the global south, in the world as well. We're in a dangerous moment. Yeah. We're in a dangerous moment. And, um, you know, I, I get that sense here too. I, I think China, the Chinese leadership feels they're in a dangerous moment as well. I think they're very much aware of the, the crisis we're in. And I think on an individual level, many of us feel it too, uh, yeah. everywhere the moment in the world right with everything that's happening right. um, so it's always good good to uh, you know chat to fellow souls because not everybody you know not everybody is open to talking about imperialism and the world system right <laughs> exactly, yeah exactly so it's always good to meet someone interested in talking about the world system um th so yeah thank you so much and take care stay well yeah look after yourself bye